Let's thank our moms again. Now, would you bow with me? Would you bow with me? And I have a word for us today about some interesting ladies from Scripture who will teach us a lesson, who will teach us God's truth that we need in our hearts, regardless of whether we're a mom today or a dad or whether we're a man or a woman, we need to hear this truth from the Lord. So in the quietness of this moment, would you pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart today? The Word says He is our teacher and He is our guide into the truth. So would you pray for yourself to be taught by the Holy Spirit today God's truth? Would you do that right now? And now would you pray for me that I can deliver this message that God has given me. Heavenly Father, thank you today for moms. For their influence in our lives. And we come now to look at your scriptures, Father, to look at some moms. And I pray the lesson that we find here, Father, will find its way into every heart this morning. Father, I pray that not one of us will leave the same way we came in, but we'll all leave changed, because your Spirit will show us the response we need to make to the truth that we'll be confronted with. And so, Father, we thank you for that. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The title of this message is Leaning Women, Not Leading Women. Leaning Women, Not Leading Women. And I want us to look at some leaning women today, not leading women. Now what I mean by that is this. Leaning women in the sense that they trusted in God. Leaning women in the sense that they leaned on God. They looked, to, they looked in faith to Him. Not leading women in the sense that you may not even recognize their names. Obscure women who appear on the pages of Scripture for a brief period of time and then move off, but leaving large footprints for us to follow. Leaving us an example to follow whether you are a man or a woman. Here are two of the three women we will look at this morning. There are their names. Now, you're an Old Testament scholar if you recognize those two names. Shipra. And Puah. Their story is found in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. So would you take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Now be honest with you. I'm just curious. How many of you know who those two ladies are before we even turn to the scriptures? Raise your hand. Kathleen is the only liar in here today. Ed Beach is another liar. Shipra and Puah, their story is found in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Take your Bible and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew rack there in front of you. And if you'll turn to page 45, you'll find Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. If you didn't bring a Bible with you today, we have one in the pew rack there. And it's on page 45. Let me say this also. If you don't have a Bible at all, take the one in the pew rack home. You can have it. It's our gift to you. If you don't have a Bible... Take the one in the pew rack with you. I'm, I mean that. I'm being honest. Take it with you and read it this week. All right? But it's on page 45 if you're looking at the pew Bible. Now, what did these two ladies do that all of us need to do? Whether we're a man or a woman. What did these two ladies do that led to the blessing of God in their life? Now, most of us here today, but I would dare say all of us here today, would like to have the blessing of God on our lives. I believe these two obscure women, plus one more that we will look at in just a moment, can teach us an important truth about having the blessing of God on our lives. 
Let's hear their story. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was Shiprah and the other Puah, there they are, Hebrew midwives. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dwelt well with the midwives... And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families. Now look back up in verse 15 at that phrase, Then the king of Egypt. A little background is needed for you, if you don't mind, just a moment. Exodus, the book of Exodus picks up where Genesis left off about 350 years later. So we're about 350 years down the road from where the book of Exodus closes. If you remember, excuse me, where the book of Genesis closes. If you remember, Genesis leaves off with Joseph and his family of Israelites down in Egypt. And that's where they were. For 350 years now, time has passed, and there the Israelites remained, down there in Egypt, multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying as the generations went by for 350 years. Look at verse 8, if you would. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithon and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Now that word in dread means that they had an abhorrence for they hated them. They, they, they did not want to be around them any longer. If there had been a dairy bar in Egypt, the conversation would have gone like this. Man, this is getting out of hand. We have got to stop this growth by these foreigners or else they're going to be running over us in a few years. And so the Egyptian brutality toward the Israelites increased. We read that in verse 13. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. And they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, that tactic didn't slow them down at all. As far as the multiplication of the population went, that tactic did not work either. So Pharaoh unleashed another plan, an even more sinister plan. Murder. Infanticide. And that's when Shipra and Puah stepped to the forefront of Scripture. Shipra means beauty. Puah means splendor. And for sure, it was a deed of beauty and splendor that these two women performed. Now these two women apparently oversaw all the Jewish midwives and listen again to their instructions. Listen again to Pharaoh's instructions to these Hebrew midwives found in verse 16. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if, a, if it's a son, you kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. Now, that word birth stool jumps out at me. I'm, I'm not even sure I want to know what it means. Or what it looked like. Actually, it was two stones upon which the Israelite women crouched while they were giving birth. 
And that's about as far as I'm going. Because you see, I wasn't one of those modern day dads who enters the delivery room with a party hat on, a CC's pizza, recording it all on his phone. No, when Andrew and Austin were born, I'm the one drinking the orange juice that they had given Deborah. And I'm the one having to sit down and put my head between my knees to keep from passing out. So I'm just going to leave it at birth stool, okay? I'm going to leave it right there. Seriously, though, Pharaoh's orders to these midwives were to watch closely. And as that baby emerged, and when you can tell the sex of that child, if it is a male child, you kill it. Possibly suffocating the little boy before he ever uttered his first cry. And then the midwife could say to the mother, Oh, I'm sorry, this one was chill, stillborn. What a heinous crime. What a murderous order. We, we've seen the same thing in our news recently. If you paid attention to Dr. Gosnell's trial in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania... Babies born alive and then killed. Murderous, heinous crime. But look at verse 17. Look, look. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. What, what heroines these ladies were. These midwives were not intimidated by the Pharaoh. These ladies feared God more than they feared the decree of the king. And there's even a little humor in their excuse. The word vigorous in verse 19 literally means lively. They told a frowning, unhappy Pharaoh, Man, oh man, Pharaoh, those Hebrew women, they are fast. When we hear they're about to give birth, we rush right over to that house. But zip, pop, it's over. That baby's here. Before we get there, the baby's already here. What can we do? Some of you mothers gave birth like that. Some of you mothers did not give birth like that. And Pharaoh bought the whole thing. Who was he to argue with two courageous midwives, Shipra and Puah? And here's what they teach us. Let's begin our point of application this way. Above all else, seek the favor of God. These midwives valued God's favor more than that of Pharaoh. Let me ask you a question. Whose favor are you seeking this morning? Who is it that you want to please? Maybe a boss? Maybe a boyfriend? Who is it that you want to please? Who... Whose favor are you seeking? Even if they ask you to do something that you feel uncomfortable doing. Even if they ask you to do something wrong. You still want their favor. Whose opinion do you value the most? That's what it boils down to. Young man, young lady. Whose opinion do you value the most? Who is it that is going to set your standards? Who is it that's going to set the standards for your behavior? Who is it that's going to set the standards for your habits? Who, who determines your choices and, and, and what they will be? Who are you trying to please? Above all else, seek the favor of God. Now, this passage reminds us of something else, and that is, is that God's law must always come before man's law. The fact is, there is a time to submit to government decrees, and there is a time to resist government decrees. Scripture nowhere teaches a blanket submission to civil authority. 
Civil authority does have its limits. Submission to civil authority has limits. Acts 5.29, Peter sums it up. We must obey God rather than man. In other words, a government's edict, when it directly violates God's clearly stated will, we ought to fear God more than the laws of men. Augustine, in commentating... In writing about this passage commentary, Augustine says, God rewarded them for their piety, not their deceit. God rewarded them. He rewarded these women for doing what was right in His eyes. And there's always the possibility, always the possibility that those Hebrew moms really were fast. But dear family... Above all else, seek the favor of God. Now, I told you there's a third woman I mentioned earlier. This third woman can also teach us, whether we're a man or a woman this morning, some things about leaning on God, some things about trusting Him. Frustrated and angry because His decrees were not working, With his murderous fury, knowing no restraint, Pharaoh issues another command. Look at verse 21. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews. This was a command to all the Egyptians, not not the midwives. This is a command to every Egyptian in his kingdom. Every son that is born to the Hebrews, when you find a son born to the Hebrews, you cast him into the Nile, but you let every daughter live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took him, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. Will she obey the edict or not? She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Will she cast him into the Nile or not? Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Now, the third woman's name is not even mentioned in this text. But she has a lot to teach us. In fact, it is not until we get to the sixth chapter of Exodus that we find out her name, and it is this, Jochebed. Jochebed. Now, you recognize that, most of you, even though you're not Old Testament scholars, most of you would say, that's, that's Moses' mom. And here is her story in verses 1 through 10. She, too, feared the God of heaven more than she feared the Pharaoh on the earth. And though Exodus 2 doesn't mention it, Moses is not her firstborn. Two children have already been born to her before Pharaoh's murderous edict. There is Miriam, who's already a daughter, and she's not quite a teenager. And then there's Aaron, who is three years old. And now here comes this baby. And verse 2 says that he was a fine child. Some Hebrew translators say the word means beautiful. Aren't all babies? Especially grand babies. But, but evidently this was especially true for Moses. There's a Jewish historian named Josephus who writes that adults would stop 
and stare at Moses as a young boy when they saw him playing with other children. That there was something about Moses' appearance that would make adults stop and stare at him and watch him play with other children. Charlton Heston, he was indeed. Now, you can't hide a baby forever. Aaron, stay away from the baby brother. Miriam, keep that, keep that baby quiet. Shh, shh, everybody be quiet. I, I think I hear somebody coming down the road. You can't keep a baby quiet forever. And so Jochebed devises a creative plan. A plan which seeks the favor of God above all else. With great care and tenderness, Jochebed mixes a tar-like substance from the banks of the Nile and covers a little wicker basket to make it watertight. It's interesting to me that the same word for basket in this second chapter of Exodus is used for Noah's Ark in Genesis chapter 6. One of these days I'll understand the theological connection between those two. But this is the same word that is used to describe Noah's ark. This little wicker basket. And Jochebed takes this little basket that she has made and she sets it among the reeds that grow along the side of the bank. She positions that basket precisely where she wants it. Like I said, she had a plan. And then which, with what must have been a breaking heart, Yet with great faith in God, she sits her child in it. Now this is free. Think about this. This is, this is free. God's plan for the deliverance of his people is now reduced to a tiny baby under a decree of death set on a river inside a fragile basket. God, you got a plan to deliver your people? Yes. It is that little baby in that basket under a decree of death floating in that river. God always has a plan, dear people. And nothing can thwart his purposes. Fast forward hundreds of years and God's plan for the redemption of all mankind is reduced to a tiny baby born in a feed trough in an insignificant little town and the king tried to kill him too. You got a plan to redeem mankind, God? I sure do. It's that little baby boy in that feed trough outside of Bethlehem. God always has a plan, and nothing can thwart His purposes. Sir, would you remember that when your life seems like a mess? Ma'am, would you remember that when your life seems totally out of control? God always has a plan, and nothing can thwart His purposes. Now, back to Jacobed. Jochebed, this favor of God seeking mother, probably knew, probably knew the bathing habits of Pharaoh's daughter. She knew that Pharaoh's daughter would come at a certain place, at a certain time, and she had Miriam in place. But what she did not know was what Pharaoh's daughter would do, as I said a moment ago. What would the daughter do with this little baby? Now, if Ramses II was the Pharaoh of the Exodus, Ramses II has 60 daughters. This is just one of them. And what would this one daughter do? Josephus gives her a name, Thermuthus. Thermuthus, it's a strange name, but the Egyptians considered the Nile one of their gods. So would this princess believe that the river God had delivered this child to her? Would this princess believe that the river God had provided her with, with a child? Or would she carry out her father's orders and plunge the baby into the water? Would she obey his stern decree and drown the baby right there? That is what Jacobed did not know. There were no guarantees and all Jacobed could do was trust in God and lean on Him. And you know the rest of the story. 
And it's time to complete our point of application. Above all else, seek the favor of God. It puts you in the position of blessing. Above all else, seek the favor of God. It puts you in the position of blessing. Look at how the Lord blessed Jacobet. She gets to raise her own child with the official sanction and protection of Pharaoh's daughter. Now Miriam never mentioned to Pharaoh's daughter that the Hebrew nurse she found to nurse the baby just happened to be the baby's mother. That is the blessing of God. And she even gets paid to raise her own child. Wow. You not only get the child back from the edge of death. You not only get the official protection of Pharaoh's daughter. You get paid to raise him. That dear family is the hand of God's blessing on her life. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Above all else, seek the favor of God. It puts you in the position of blessing. Just a minute, go back to Shipra and, and Pua in chapter 1 in verse 21. It says, And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Shipra and Pua found husbands and they married and they had homes and families of their own. These women were rewarded by God Himself, blessed by their Heavenly Father because they sought His favor above all else. It put them in the position of blessing. Listen to me, dear family. We spent four weeks studying the prodigal son. We talked about the prodigal son. We talked about the elder brother. We talked about the loving father. We talked about the fact that God loves you unconditionally. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. We talked about the God who receives you back from your wayward ways completely. There is nothing you can do to earn His forgiveness. You don't have to earn His forgiveness. You don't have to earn His acceptance. But listen to me. God does not bless your disobedience. Not for one minute will He bless you for your disobedience. Yes, He loves you unconditionally, but He blesses obedience. He blesses those who seek Him above all else. He rewards those who trust Him fully with their lives. And that's what Jacobed did. And she ends up in the hall of faith. We call it Hebrews Chapter 11. God rewarded her faith. God blessed her beyond her fondest hopes because she sought Him above all else. The principle holds true, dear family. The principle holds true for our lives as well. You can't live in open disobedience to God and expect His blessing. I believe you can expect His chastening if you live in open disobedience. Child of God, listen to me. End your disobedience today. Repent and get the sin out of your life and turn and begin to seek God's favor afresh and anew. You've been pleasing yourself for too long. You've been seeking the favor of another person for too long. It's time to get your priorities straight again. Above all else, seek the favor of God. It puts you in the position of blessing. Now I want to close like this. Look at chapter 2 and verse 10. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. When the child grew older, we're not told how old, four years old, maybe five Six, possibly seven years old. But do you know what happened in those four, five years? 
Jacobed taught him his spiritual heritage. Jacobed taught this little baby about the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacobed, like every mother seeks to do, Jacobed, like only a mother can do, Jacobed laid a godly foundation in this little boy's life. Then the day came, the scripture says, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. For all Jochebed knew, she would never see her little boy again. What claim would she ever have for visiting him? She was only his nurse. She was a female slave in that culture. She was a member of a despised race. So the day when the royal summons came, she gave him a bath, washed one last time behind his ears, dried him off, combed his hair, dressed him in his best tunic, probably a hand down from Aaron, and down the path toward the palace, he went. And he became the son of another woman. With a completely different set of values. And she gave him his name. Moses. Pharaoh's daughter named him. A name that is a mixture of the two worlds from which he was from. An Egyptian word meaning son. And a Hebrew word meaning to draw out. The daughter of Pharaoh drew out her son And named him Moses. He did not bear that name until she gave it to him. I don't know what kind of mom you had. Or what memories Mother's Day holds for you. Maybe today has stirred some feelings that you haven't felt in a while. And some of those feelings may be good Some of those feelings may not be so good. If your childhood falls into that category, the latter category, then I want you to listen to these words. These words are for you. One man writes, I'd like to deliver a beautiful message to you, my friend. God's hand on your life may be just beginning to make its mark. That steep hill you've been climbing for such a long time may be the ramp to a destiny beyond your dreams. I do not believe there is any such thing as an accidental or ill-timed birth. You may have arrived in a home that was financially strapped. You may have known brokenness, hurt, and insecurity since your earliest days. But please hear me on this. You were not an accident. At some point in my youth, and no doubt with the best intentions, my parents informed me that I was an accident. An unintended child. So I figured if I was born an accident, I might as well live like an accident. And that's precisely what I did. That knowledge greatly shaped my early life. And then one day I learned that God could use so-called accidents. God uses those who seem ill-fitted for a significant life. All of a sudden, the pieces begin to fall together. And I begin to realize that he had a specific reason and purpose for me to be alive. To my parents, I may have been an accident. But in his eyes, I wasn't an accident at all. Even though my life hadn't been everything I wanted it to be, or everything it should or could or might have been, God wasn't finished with me yet. And the good news is, he isn't finished with you either. Not By a long shot. Charles Swindoll wrote those words. God makes no mistakes. And he's able to take your life, sir. Your life, ma'am. That 
that might have been full of heartache and maybe still is, that, that might have been full of pain as a child and maybe still is, that, that might have had many regrets. God is able to take your life and turn it around and use you for His glory. Above all else, seek the favor of God. It puts you in the position of blessing. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. These, these three dear ladies, Shipra, Pua, Jacobed, not leading women of Scripture by any means at all, but Father, ladies that can teach us this valuable lesson about seeking you. I I pray this morning, Father, for those of us who know you as Lord and Savior and who struggle every day with priorities in our life and who it is that we need to please and what needs to be number one and two and three. And Father, I, I pray for those who just struggle with with time commitments and time restraints. And I pray today, Father, there would be a repenting of things that have gotten in a way of their lives, gotten in your way of being who you need to be in their lives. And I pray, Father, that we could come today and acknowledge again that above all else, Father, we're going to seek your favor. And know, Father, that that puts us in a place of blessing. I pray today, Father, for those who do not know you yet as Lord and Savior. That today would be the day they discover you as a God, Father, who who has a plan for their life. And they would come and trust you today. Come and give their life to you. And Father, I pray today for those who, like Charles Swindoll, grew up believing they were an accident. I pray that you would show them, Father, that you make no accidents. You have a plan and a purpose for their lives. And you can use them for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand. If you would, to your feet, would you stand? Just right now, stand. And in a moment, we're going to sing. If you're here today and would come trusting God, turning your life over to Him, when we sing this very first verse, you come. Our staff will be here. I'll be at the front. You come. Let's sing, Fred. You come right now.